probably say uh, that I'm particularly grateful to Rupert for um, coming to speak to us today because it's been um, very much because of Rupert's conversations over the years that um, the idea of this meeting today uh, emerged. And um, so it seems to me highly appropriate that we, that Rupert is um, speaking to us today. And um, I'm certainly looking forward to what you're going to be saying. So, um, uh, obviously, I don't think uh, Ruth Sheldrake needs um, a very detailed uh, introduction. Um, his eminence as a biologist uh, is, um, is very clear, and uh, but also I think what's extraordinary about Rupert's uh, contribution is not just his eminence as a scientist, but also his openness to questions on the edges of science, and particularly recently his books on the relationship between science, spirituality, um, religion, and philosophy, and theology. And he has, in fact, um, published very significant work uh, in this uh, area. I remember most striking, forgive me for the anecdote, but one of the most striking papers I've ever heard was when uh, Rupert's son was a student at Clare and invited his father to address the so-called dilettante society um, on the topic of the consciousness is the sudden conscious. <laughs> and that subsequently became a paper in Consciousness studies, right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So um, it's with gratitude and immense enthusiasm that uh, we welcome uh, Rupert Sheldrake to speak to us this evening. Thank you. Well, thank you, Douglas. I'll stand talking up. I stand. I stand up to talk of uh, standing. Um, my interest in panpsychism is really from the scientific point of view. <coughs> Uh, I think the sciences are crippled and, and restricted by the dogmatic mechanistic materialism that's become the leading orthodoxy for sciences all over the world. And if we're going to move on, then there has to be some other framework within which the sciences can work. And I think an orga organismic, organically based panpsychism is the most promising alternative to mechanistic materialism. So. Um, that's where I'm coming from in this talk. So I'm, 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 I very much appreciate what I've learned today about some of the views of Plotinus and Iambricus and other uh, great thinkers in the Western tradition. Uh, but I'm not speaking as a scholar of philosophy, but really as somebody interested in the future of the sciences. There have been several attempts to uh, move the sciences in a more panpsychic direction in the last hundred years. And I'll just go through four of them uh, very briefly to summarize them. Um, the title of our whole day today is called Panpsychism Problems and Prospects. So I'm going to focus on the problems and the prospects of these different approaches. And then as a thought experiment, uh, going to develop these ideas in connection precisely with what Douglas said, the consciousness of the sun. Um, and I have a few spare off prints. My paper is the sun conscious, <coughs> the journal of consciousness studies. So if any of you would like one, there's a few here. Um, but to start with, there the, 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 have been four notable attempts to develop panpsychism uh, in uh, the last hundred years in relation to the sciences. And the first one that I want to mention is Alfred North Whitehead. I'm sure most of you, all of you are familiar with his work. Um, one of the things that Whitehead proposed in the 1920s was that the sciences should stop using the metaphor of the machine as the primary metaphor for nature, as in mechanistic materialism, and starting with the mechanical philosophy in the 17th century 
but instead used the model of the organism. And he put forward what he called a philosophy of organism. And part of that was the view that nature is made of organisms at different levels of complexity and size. Even atoms and molecules are like small organisms. They're complex structures of activity. Um, and then uh, biological organisms are not machines as contemporarily thought in biology, uh, but organisms. And the whole cosmos is like an organism. So uh, it was an organic philosophy of nature and that led to uh, a development of thought within philosophy of science, uh, seeing nature as made up of nested hierarchies of organisms. So you'd have a series of levels, subatomic particles uh, within atoms, which is a higher level of organization at which the whole is more than some parts. Atoms are within molecules, a higher level of organization, molecules within crystals, uh, and then within living organisms, organelles in cells, in tissues, in organs, in organisms, in societies of organisms, in ecosystems. So this nested hierarchy of levels of organization, uh, in fact, goes right through the whole universe. So the planets are in solar systems, solar systems in galaxies, galaxies in galactic clusters, and then ultimately the whole universe it can be seen as a, a, a large organism, the largest possible organism. So that view which Whitehead started has been developed by a number of thinkers within science. Um, the writer Arthur Kerstler was very keen on this and he, uh, he for this levels of, within levels, he coined the word holarchy. Uh, the alternative term for this worldview is nested hierarchy, but he thought holarchy was a better term because there's always a wholeness at a higher level within which things happen. Um, so that was one influence of Whitehead, and um, I'll come back to Whitehead <coughs> in a moment. But the Whiteheadian impulse within the sciences in the 1920s was based on his deep understanding of quantum physics. He was the first philosopher really to understand the importance of the quantum revolution, and that's because he was a mathematician. Most philosophers took decades to catch up, even if they have caught up even today. But Whitehead got it straight away and, and realized some of the main implications straight away. He realized that matter is not stuff. It's not just inert stuff, it's a process. Atoms and molecules and everything in the natural world is a process. So it's sometimes called process philosophy and his followers usually call it that. But the actual move of the, the biological sciences from the 1920s onwards was in exactly the opposite direction towards ever greater reductionism and uh, molecular biology and trying to reduce organisms to the molecular level. And this became the most prestigious form of biology and it still is, genes, molecules, proteins, and so on. Um, the laboratory of molecular biology here in Cambridge was a leading center for this, and, and it still is. And Francis Crick, who worked here, has now had the whole of the Medical Research Council Institute in London named after him, the Francis Crick Institute, which is the main center for medical research. The very name tells you their emphasis, because he was never a doctor. He never cured anyone of anything. He started as a crystallographer and um, uh, was a key figure in molecular biology. But the fact the Medical Research Council's leading lab is called the Francis Crick Institute tells you exactly what they're doing. What they are doing is looking at molecules inside cancer cells and brain cells and so on. It's a very reductive, um, narrow approach. Another eruption of holism into the scientific world was through the Gaia hypothesis of James Lovelock, who proposed that the whole Earth is like a living organism, Gaia, Mother Earth. And um, this was seen as a revolutionary breakthrough by many people in science. When I was living and working in India, I tried to explain it to a, a group of Indians. Many of modern science has now shown that the Earth is a living organism called Mother Earth. They were deeply unimpressed. <laughs> as one of them said, that's what we've believed all along. <laughs> that's took it for granted. Um, anyway, within the scientific world, the Gaia hypothesis was initially very controversial, then it became accepted as a good way of thinking about the interrelatedness of parts of the planet, including the climate, and of course it's very relevant to climate change. 
Um, but it stood as a kind of sole example of holistic thinking in science as a kind of weird anomaly. No one sort of thought it through and took it to higher levels or thought it, it was it still is a kind of strange anomaly within science that uh, the Gaia hypothesis, I mean, I think it's the beginning of a much bigger paradigm shift, but for decades now, it's just remained as a kind of isolated example of holistic thinking. Then uh, there's another strand of panpsychism, which really, um, in its modern form, um, was popularized by Galen Strawson in a famous 2006 paper in the Journal of Consciousness Studies called Realistic Monism. Uh, the subtitle is uh, that how materialism implies, uh, how physicalism implies panpsychism. And what Strawson's aim to do is to overcome the hard problem. As you all know, one of the big problems for materialists, and as Philip Goff has pointed out to us earlier today, uh, one of the big problems for materialists who say the universe is made of unconscious matter uh, following impersonal laws and governed only by chance with no purpose and so on. Uh, one of their biggest problems is that how come that we're conscious? We ought not to be conscious if the whole universe is made of unconscious matter and we're made of unconscious matter. Um, so some materialist uh, philosophers argue that we're not conscious, that it's an illusion, it doesn't do anything. Uh, some of their opponents point out that to try and dismiss consciousness as an illusion doesn't really <laughs> work because illusion is itself a mode of consciousness. Um, and so then we get back to the hard problem and then say, well, it's just another way of talking about brain activity. Um, so um, that people go round and round in circles and have done for a long time, which is why it's called the hard problem. Um, so Gell and Strawson argued that if instead of seeing consciousness as something that suddenly appears or mysteriously emerges from unconscious matter. If you say that there's a tiny bit of consciousness in electrons and protons and atoms, then you can say it's a difference of degree rather than a difference in kind. Uh, and you can overcome the harm problem by widening the, widening the definition of matter to include consciousness. Um, well, I've tried, I know him personally, and uh, I've tried to sort of see how far he's prepared to imagine this transition. And he doesn't really want to imagine it at all very much. He just wants it to be a way of solving the problem, the hard problem, by attributing a small degree of, of consciousness to ele electrons without thinking very much about what is it like to be an electron. Uh, it seems to be quite an interesting question. I mean, electrons are attracted to positive charges, they're repelled by negative charges, and no doubt have feelings of attraction and repulsion. Um, and uh, one could probably think of other aspects of what it's like to be an electron. But that's not what that kind of panpsychism is about. It's about trying to solve the hard problem while retaining materialism by muddying the water, by um, trying to broaden the definition of matter. Um, and then uh, uh, I would say that Philip has done more than anyone really to popularize panpsychism in, in recent years uh, as, as a, an approach to nature. Um, and of course, that, as a philosopher, uh, it, his, his work has um, really taken the, the hard problem as one of the starting points in the tradition of Galen Strawson. Uh, would you agree with that? That you're in that tradition. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Thank you. Well, I wasn't sure if you'd think that way, but it seemed to me that you are, uh, yes. So in the, in the sense of what? Trying to solve the problem. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then another uh, uh, more technical attempt to do this is, is called in Integrated Information Theory, or IIT, which some of you have probably come across. And this was put forward by uh, an Italian, Tononi, um, who tried to come up with a mathematical definition of consciousness in terms of a quantity called phi, the Greek letter phi, um, and claims that you can calculate uh, the level of consciousness in a given system, depending on how much in in inherent information it integrates. The key thing is that integrative information theory says that consciousness is integrated. It's made up of parts with them which interact, but they're integrated. And I think that's its great strength, the emphasis on integration. The weakness is that it starts from a kind of reductionist bottom-up molecular approach. So 
in trying to calculate phi um, through the interaction between nerve cells, even with a nematode worm, a tiny worm a millimetre long with 300 nerve cells, I mean, about the simplest nervous system that science has ever studied, uh, someone worked out that to calculate all the possible interactions to come up with a value for phi for a one millimetre long nematode worm, uh, using a, a high-powered laptop computer would take 10 to the 79 years, vastly longer than the uh, uh, age of the universe. And so it's not exactly a very practical way of arriving at uh, how, how the, the nature of consciousness in quantitative terms. When you come to the human brain, you'd need multiverses of calculation time. So, it's, but I think it strengthens the emphasis on integration of the wholeness of consciousness, the fact it has a wholeness that integrates the various elements within it. If there's nothing to integrate, then there's no consciousness. The more that it integrates, the more, the higher the level of consciousness. And then finally, I, I mentioned something that's really outside the academic world altogether, which has provided a popular base for panpsychism, namely psychedelics. As you know, uh, many, many people have taken psychedelics now, and there are retreat centers. It's a flourishing business in Brazil and Costa Rica <coughs> to go and take ayahuasca with neo-shamans. Um, and here in Britain, you can't legally take mushrooms or other psychedelics, but you can go to Holland where people organize weekend retreats where you take magic mushrooms with a guide who guides you through the process. <coughs> And the fact there are now these legal retreats in countries where these are legal um, means that many more people have tried them than when they were purely uh, you know, something you just did at the Glastonbury Festival or uh, illegally as students and so on. And there's now a much, much more serious uh, side to this because there's a lot of well-funded research on psychedelics, um, partly for medical uses, treating intractable depression, and, uh, and uh, addiction, um, and partly for investigating their role in stimulating creativity. Um, an interesting point about these psychedelics is that many people who take them undergo a kind of paradigm shift in the way they see the world. And, and I have to say, personally, I experienced this. I first took LSD in 1971, long ago and far away. Um, but um, the, the, for me, uh, having been raised in a mechanistic materialist uh, view, having adopted an atheist uh, view, which went as part of a package deal with my scientific education, uh, this literally expanded my mind in a way that made me much, much more interested in consciousness. I started meditating, I read about Indian philosophy, and so on. And so many people who've taken psychedelics feel, uh, they say they feel a much closer connection with nature, they feel that nature is alive, they feel themselves relating to plants and to animals in a new way. And uh, get a kind of, and because many of these neo-shamanic ceremonies are conducted by people who claim to be in shamanic traditions, uh, which are generally speaking traditions that take for granted the aliveness of nature and the genuine uh, sort of uh, kind of panpsychic view of animals and plants. And, and, and the rest of the universe. There's this kind of grassroots panpsychism now, which is not really very connected with the academic world and, and the kinds of theories we've been talking about today, but which is people searching in that general direction. Um, I just finished reading a book by a young British financier, Ben Goldsmith, whose father, Sir James Goldsmith, was a kind of swashbuckling buckling capitalist and whose uncle, Edward Goldsmith, uh, founded The Ecologist magazine and was a leading environmentalist. And in this book called God is an Octopus, uh, Ben Goldsmith describes how his 15-year-old daughter was, it was killed in a tragic <coughs> accident on his farm. And it led him to, he'd never thought much about spirituality before, led him on a quest going to see spirit mediums, thinking about the meaning of life, does consciousness survive, ayahuasca ceremonies with uh, shamanic uh, practitioners, um, including the channeled message that cryptically came through in one of them, God is an octopus, hence the title of his book. Uh, but it's a book of a some, somewhat a, a, an exploratory journey, trying to find uh, more about the life of nature, the meaning of life, and how all these things are connected. 
I mean, a notable feature of these neo-shamanic um, things is that they're very they're utterly unconnected with the Christian tradition. They fit, they've come out of, if anything, the kind of New Age movement. And the New Age movement is really based on the ABC principle, anything but Christian. So it's, <laughs> it, you know, shamanic dream catchers, you know, a little bit of sort of African drumming, you know, Mexican shamanism, uh, you know, Australian Aboriginal didgeridoos, you know, a kind of pick and mix of um, things from shamanic cultures, or possibly Buddhism light, um, that, but, but not certainly not Christian. Um, and uh, however, this is changing. There's now in the United States something called the uh, Christian Psychedelic Association. It's led by a priest who's called Hunt Priest. That's his actual name. <laughs> <laughs> And they've set up a chapter here in England, and there's quite a lot going on below the surface here in England in this area. So that's another ingredient. It means there's a popular base for panpsychism. A lot of people are really looking for a worldview. They haven't come to this through the inadequacy of science. Uh, they have come to it through the feeling that the modern world has left a whole lot of things out. Um, and it's part of a beginning of a really big journey, I think, a big cultural journey that's happening. Um, and it gives people a strong personal motive for these questions. It's not just something in an academic seminar room. There's a get it, this sense of urgency in Ben Goldsmith's book. There's a real, real need to find a more meaningful way of relating to the world and seeing it as a whole and as alive. Well, one of the things that uh, I think a limitation of the Galen Strawson type approach is that it stops when you get to the level of the brain. The whole thing is designed to explain away the heart problem by dissolving it, um, as if the brain is the most complex structure in the universe. In fact, this is something people often say, um, but it's not. Um, and the um, I, uh, one of the reasons I got interested in the consciousness of the sun is a kind of thought experiment for panpsychism. Um, if panpsychism is what it says it is, then the sun ought to be conscious and the other stars and the galaxies. Um, and what happens if we think about that? You're, there's every disincentive to thinking about it within the scientific world because it's taken for granted the sun's just an unconscious like everything else, so it's heavenly bodies, it's just a big hydrogen bomb generating electricity, uh, uh, light and uh, uh, radiation and so on, um, through uh, fusion, nuclear fusion. Um, and so it doesn't, and it's regarded as a sort of ridiculously childish question. Um, the fact that people have believed the sun is conscious in almost all traditional cultures is seen as proof that it's childish because they're superstitious and uneducated. The fact that children draw the sun with a smiley face is further proof that it's a childish view uh, <laughs> that any educated person has grown out of or ought to grow out of. So it, it's not a topic that's often discussed. Um, uh, but I think that's precisely because it, it, it really takes panpsychism seriously in a way that does interface with science, that this is an important question. Um, now, there are, as it happens, a few people who are discussing this within the scientific and philosophical world. There's um, a philosopher called Greg Matloff, who's a, a, not a philosopher, he's a physicist in New York, at one of the universities in New York City, um, who's engaged, he designed solar propulsion systems for spacecraft. So he's interested in space and is a you know, professor of physics. Well, he's put forward something called the volitional star hypothesis about the sun and other stars. And his idea is this, that within contemporary physics, um, the structure of the galaxy, uh, of our and other galaxies, can't be explained very easily by gravitation. Physicists try, are still trying to explain the whole universe in terms of gravity. It's kind of one size fits all theory. Um, but it doesn't work. The stars are going around the center of the galaxy too fast. Galaxies are attracting each other much more than they ought to be if it's just gravity. So um, in order to solve this problem, while sticking to the gravitational hypothesis, uh, they have titrated in uh, hitherto unknown form of matter called dark matter. And 
you, they add in just enough to make their equations balanced to explain uh, why galaxies behave exactly as they do. And if one of them has a bulge on one side, they just add in a bit more dark matter to explain the bulge. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect theory because it fits the facts wonderfully well because you can put in exactly the right <coughs> amount of dark matter to create the right answer. <coughs> the trouble is that no one has any idea what dark matter <coughs> is. All attempts to detect it have failed. Uh, we now have about five times more dark matter than real matter, or known matter in the universe. And having added all that extra dark matter in, in the 1990s, uh, the equations predicted the universe, instead of going on expanding, uh, would allow so much mass, that uh, gravity should stop, it, slow the expansion down, and it should then begin to contract faster and faster until it all ended in tears in the reverse of the Big Bang, known in the trade as the Big Crunch. Well, it turned out in 1999 that instead of slowing down, the expansion of the universe was speeding up. So um, in order to explain that, uh, then they had to introduce something else to make it push it apart, and that's dark energy. Um, so now 95% of reality is made up of dark matter and dark energy, according to physics. Uh, there's no independent evidence for either of them. So a few, a tiny number of physicists have begun to think of alternatives. One of them is Greg Matlock, who says, well, what if stars are conscious to a certain degree and can move under their own steam? We know that they shoot out great flares like jet propulsion. If they've shot out a lot of flares on one side rather than the other, they move in a particular direction. Um, and so his idea is that just as embryos, cells in embryos take up their right position uh, without having to have embryonic dark matter gravitationally pulling them into the right position, they move around, take up the right position. So stars may take up their position within the galaxy in accordance with a kind of galactic plan or order uh, by moving under their own steam um, and removing the need for dark matter. So if you have conscious suns, you can get rid of dark matter. But of course, most physicists don't like that at all. They much prefer unconscious dark matter to conscious stars because they, they're not into panpsychism yet. But um, they are into mysteries. I mean, dark matter and dark energy, it's as if they've discovered the, the, the cosmic unconscious. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, they mostly take the view, well, they'll all be solved and it won't be long before we've figured out what they are. Um, this is part of an attitude that's very common in science that Karl Popper, the philosopher of science, called promissory materialism. Most things aren't explained, so what you do is issue undated promissory notes <laughs> uh, for future explanations. And of course, you can go on doing that indefinitely for almost all problems, and the fact they're undated means it's irrefutable. It's basically an act of faith. So materialism is best seen, I think, as a faith system, as a, as a, as a worldview that's believed on faith. Um, another uh, theorist is a Belgian uh, philosopher called Clément Vidal, who's put forward the Stellivor hypothesis. Um, he's pointed out that most stars in our galaxy are double stars. The sun's unusual in being a single star. Uh, most of the double stars, like Sirius, the dog star, is basically two stars orbiting around each other. One of them is much brighter than the other. And of these double stars, it's known, it's well accepted, it's standard in astronomy, that they can suck, one star can suck gas out of the other and feed, as it were, on the other. And the bright star we see in uh, uh, Sirius, the dog star, um, was a dim star uh, many millions of years ago. And it sucked most of the matter out of its companion, which is now hardly visible. So the Stellivore hypothesis uh, involves predatory stars that go around, find a single star, go and get it, move there to get an orbit around it, suck it dry, and then move on in search of another. So he's got a kind of predatory star hypothesis, not a very pretty picture of the heavens, but uh, <laughs> it's one that fits with the behavior of many organisms on Earth. And um, I suppose you could say as a natural principle, um, but uh, all of these avoid the need for dark matter. And it's just an example of what happens if you move beyond the, the narrow confines of dogmatic materialism. What I want to do now is just thinking this through a little bit more uh, about how can we conceive of non-cerebral minds within nature? Um, 
Because our present thinking about minds is heavily cerebrocentric. Um, it you know, takes the idea that consciousness only exists in human minds. That was the view until the Cambridge Declaration on Animal Consciousness about 20 years ago, when after long deliberation, a team of animal behaviorists came to the conclusion that some animals may be able to feel emotions and possibly have, even have thoughts of some kind or another. An idea that most dog and cat owners were taken for granted. But, but after a lengthy deliberation, the Cambridge Declaration of Animal Consciousness um, meant dog and cat owners could now feel they had the imprimatur of science <laughs> for recognizing the emotions in their animals. Um, so um, the, this uh, view of, of um, non cerebral uh, consciousness, I think there's three ingredients that can help us think about the consciousness of the sun, of other stars, of galaxies, and indeed perhaps of plants and molecules and other systems. And the three ingredients are firstly from Whitehead, part of his process, process philosophy, one of the less known aspects of it. It's this very fascinating idea of the relation of the mind and body being one in time rather than space. Because the normal metaphors people come up with are spatial metaphors, the inner life, the outer world, and so on. Um, and it, no one's got very far in trying to understand how mind and brain or mind and body interact um, with using that spatial metaphor. Um, it's one reason there's a hard problem. But what Whitehead pointed out is that even at the level of the electron in quantum physics, it tells us the electron is a wave. Um, it's a very fundamental part of quantum theory, protons, electrons, everything are waves, they're were wave activities. And a wave takes time to wave. You can't have a wave at an instant, nor can you have a wave at a point in space, because it takes time and space to wave in. And therefore, for a wave to exist, it has to go through at least an absolute minimum would be one wavelength, which takes time and space, um, and probably more. Uh, and so since it, waves take time to wave in, it means that their process that has a past and a future pole. And he thought that the past and the future poles were the key to the understanding of the relation of mind and um, physical bodies. That the mental pole is the future pole, the past pole <clears throat> is the physical pole. So taking an electron, for example, the electrons described in quantum physics by something called the Schrodinger wave equation, which is a wave equation that tells you all the possible things an electron could do. And what it actually does is define, defined only in terms of probability. There are certain things that are more likely than others, but this equation gives out the whole range of possibilities. They're all possible actions of this electron, electron. As soon as it interacts with something or is measured by a physicist in a lab, these many possibilities collapse down to become a definite observation or like a silver grain on a photographic plate. And this is often called the collapse of the wave function. And then new possibilities open up. So his point is that the possibilities like the future pole, all the things that the, the, the electron could do. And as soon as it's collapsed down uh, it, uh, and become a measurable object, it's in the past, but the physical pole is in the past. And then the new possibilities open up. So physical causation, which efficient causation, which science principally deals with, um, is a causation from the past. It's flowing from the past <clears throat> through the present towards the future. Mental causation is doing the opposite, is flowing from the virtual future through the present towards the past. And when they overlap in the present is where the uh, indeterminism of all systems, including quantum systems, enables the mental pole to choose among possible actions. So Whitehead's point is the main role of consciousness is to choose among possible actions. Now, uh, that would apply to us as well. Um, you know, we all chose to be here today, and it's a physical fact we're here. We can, we're being recorded, we can be photographed, it's a fact we're in this room. But we had other possibilities for this day. We could have done any of those other things too. We didn't, but the fact, so we made this choice, and it's a, a measurable physical fact. 
And now, partly as a result of the interesting talks, we've had new possibilities are opening up in our minds. So uh, the mental pole, again, is over future possibilities. Um, so that, I think, is an important part in Whitehead's uh, philosophy. Um, most of our actions are habitual. And so it's not saying that there's a conscious choice in electrons about everything. Even most of our own choices are habitual. We do most of, most of our life is habitual. Uh, so consciousness isn't all about everything that any organism, including us, does. It's about the things where there's a, a, an actual choice among possibilities. Most of the time we don't choose because we know from habit what to do. And I'm sure that's true of electrons as well. Secondly, there's a top-down form of causation in science from fields. Fields which were first described by Michael Faraday, electric and magnetic fields, in the 1840s and 50s, um, are top-down causal structures. They, they're global structures that influence things within uh, their <clears throat> range. A field is, a, the definition of a field is a region of influence. And Faraday at first thought that fields were made of subtle matter, the ether. And, Farad and Maxwell, in his equations of electromagnetism, uh, used the ether as his model. Then Einstein came along in 1905, special theory of relativity, and said the ether doesn't exist. So electromagnetic fields are made of electromagnetic fields. And uh, in superstring theories and other unified field theories, they try to explain them in terms of further fields. It's fields all the way down. Um, and um, fields have this global organizing capacity. And brains are largely organized by electromagnetic fields. The activity of brains that's interesting from the point of view of the interface with consciousness is wave patterns going through the cerebral cortex and other parts of the brain. And they're electromagnetic wave patterns caused by nerve impulses. That's what really matters. It's not so much the chemistry or the anatomy, it's the wave patterns. So most people at least implicitly believe the interface between mind and body in the brain is through electromagnetic patterns, vibratory patterns in fields. And thirdly, uh, the third ingredient is uh, my own idea about morphic fields. I think that in the holistic view of nature, the nested hierarchy view I talked about before, I think what it is that makes each system a whole that's more than some <coughs> parts is an organizing field, which I call a morphic field from the Greek word morphe, meaning form. Um, and I think that these fields have an inherent memory given by the process I call morphic resonance, um, so that crystals have a kind of memory of crisp previous crystals of their time, of their kind. kind. Uh, if you train rats to learn a new trick, then rats all around the world should be able to learn the same trick quicker just because rats have learned it here in Cambridge. If millions of people do a five-letter word puzzle like Wordle, uh, published every morning by the New York Times, then it should be easier to do the puzzle in the evening because so many people have done it. Um, it does seem to be the case. Uh, I've tried to get the New York Times to let me have the data, but uh, they're terrible spoils books and uh, haven't done so. Um, but the, the data should be there. So morphic resonance is a kind of memory principle in nature that operates not only for brains and animals, but it means crystals, plants, and potentially suns and stars could have a memory. They don't have to have memory traces. And in fact, the materialist idea that all our memories are inside our brains as physical traces uh, is an idea that's very hard to sustain uh, uh, because uh, all attempts to find memory traces so far have failed. And, uh, instead of thinking, well, maybe they're not, uh, maybe that's not how memory works, they just say, well, you know, we've failed so far, we just need billions of dollars more to do more detailed studies uh, to find the memory traces. <coughs> And they've now got to the point where they have very sophisticated electrode roads and rodent brains measuring things in greater detail than ever before. And what they found is that just in the last year or two that um, when a mouse or a rat that's been trained to run a maze remembers the way through the maze, there's a complex electromagnetic pattern of waves in their brain. When they remember it the next time, you've got the same pattern. It's clear that this pattern is to do with remembering. Um, but it's not necessarily in the same place in the brain. It might have shifted 
you know, a millimeter or two to different groups of nerve cells. Um, this really goes against the memory trace theory, which say they should all be frozen and burnt into the nerve endings or something. This phenomenon is now called representational drift. And um, it shows that, the, the, it, that it's really about the wave patterns. I think morphic resonance explains regular memory. Uh, it depends on similarity, the resonance. It's across space and time. It's a form of causation across space and time without necessarily anything in between. And um, it is based on similarity. So every one of us is more similar to ourselves in the past than we are to anybody else. And that's, I think, why we tune into our own memories. They resonate, our brains are resonating structures, not video recorders that store all the memories you know, physically inside our brains. Because we're similar to other people, we resonate with other people and have a collective memory, uh, but ours is more specific, our own. And I, so I think collective and individual memory differ in degree, but not in kind. I think they both depend on resonance. Well, needless to say, this is a controversial hypothesis. Um, and, um, uh, but I think that taking these ideas together and looking at the sun through these ideas, if we're looking for an interface with the solar mind and the solar body, then the electromagnetic field is the most obvious place to look. And the sun has extremely um, complex electromagnetic structures and vibrations and rhythms all over it. Every 11 years, the entire magnetic polarity of the sun reverses uh, and sunspot cycles run in 11 year cycles. Um, so th the sun is highly dynamic and um, constantly changing. And I think that the electromagnetic activity of the sun and indeed throughout the whole solar system through the solar wind and the, um, the stream of particles and the electric fields and the magnetic fields that come out of the sun, they go right through the whole solar system until at the very end edge of the solar system is a membrane called, like an electromagnetic membrane called the heliopause, uh, which is where the solar wind interfaces with the galactic wind because there's a galactic wind of electromagnetically charged particles flowing through the arms of the galaxy. Um, and the whole galaxy is an electrical system with magnetic field lines a million light years long. Um, and I think the whole, so the stars and the galaxies are full of these electromagnetic fields. And if they, if these fields are an interface with um, conscious processes, uh, then we have a physical basis uh, for this, uh, the mind of the sun or the galaxy or the other stars. In terms of memories, then there's no reason why the sun and the galaxies shouldn't have their own memory through self-resonance. If it depended on memory traces in synaptic endings, of course, they couldn't have a memory. They're too hot. Uh, but uh, if, if it's a matter of resonance, there's no reason they shouldn't have memory as well. And then um, the, the sun may be able to choose among possible actions. And what possible actions could it choose? But I'm not suggesting it chooses its orbit in the galaxy, which is based on gravitation, which I don't think its choice would extend to shifting its gravitational pull. It could shift the way it moves through jet propulsion through these solar flares. And I think part of the mind of the sun may be concerned with the direction in which solar flares are ejected. And there are even bigger events called coronal mass ejections, where huge amounts of particles of charged matter is flat out into the uh, surroundings of the sun. If one of them hits, if there's one that pointed towards the earth, <coughs> hit the earth, it would take out our power systems. I mean, people are aware of this danger. We, we've created long distance power transmission lines, which are perfect receivers for a coronal mass ejection or a massive solar flare. It would cause the transformers to, just to break down. And you could say, well, we could replace the transformers, but not if the entire system of Europe and, and North America and so on uh, was taken up by a solar flare. Uh, it would take months to make new transformers and install them. Meanwhile, everything we depend on, you know, technologies, computers, smartphones, credit cards, all that would just grind to a halt. The sun could make that happen anytime it wanted. Um, and uh, many people in traditional cultures realize the sun uh, has a huge power over our lives and um, try to be on good terms with it. Uh, when I lived in India, I was very struck by the way that 
One of the central prayers in Hinduism is the Gayatri Mantra, which is a prayer for the, I'll read Radha Krishna's translation of it. Um, we meditate on the adorable glory of the radiant sun. May he inspire our intelligence. Um, and this is chanted by devout Hindus every day. And they, the Brahmins, I've seen it myself many times in India, in holy rivers, they immerse themselves at the moment of dawn. And then facing the sun, they chant the Gayatri Mantra to the rising sun. And this is, you know, keeping on good relations with the sun, not just taking it for granted. So in most traditional cultures, people have thought that the stars and the planets were alive. Plato called them the visible gods. And so did many people in the Platonic tradition. The idea that there's intelligence in these heavenly bodies. So I think that these uh, are all ways in which we can think of um, consciousness in, in, in sun, stars, and celestial bodies. We could apply some of the same principles to thinking about the consciousness of plants. You know, if they have a conscious mind, could there be an electrical interface? Well, yes, there could. All the membranes are charged, they have electrical impulses. Do they have decisions they could make, uh, one choosing one thing rather than another? Well, maybe which way to grow or for example, <coughs> which way to send out tendrils and so on. I mean, it, so it provides a way of thinking about but panpsychism in, in a way that might interface with measurable uh, features of um, living organisms and celestial bodies. And I think that the idea of the interface with the electromagnetic field uh, gives us a new way of thinking about the omniscience of the world soul or the cosmic <clears throat> mind, um, because if the interface between our own minds, however we explain it, uh, however we explain the relation of mind and body, there has to be some kind of interface. Uh, if we think of it as primarily electromagnetic, um, and all our senses work through electromagnetism, because smell, hearing, sight, they're all translated into vibratory patterns inside the brain, which is how, uh, so they're all turned into electrical patterns. Um, if we think of that as the interface, then if we look at the entire cosmos, it's permeated by electromagnetic fields. The, the entire cosmos, is. that's why we can see distant stars and galaxies, because it's full of electromagnetic fields. The galaxies are linked up by plasma, uh, like the internet. The galaxies are, are now known to be linked up over millions of light years by plasma bridges through which huge electric currents are passing with magnetic fields. Uh, so the whole universe is linked up electromagnetically, it's filled with the electromagnetic field. And I think that could be the sense organ or one of the sense organs of a, 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 a cosmic mind. And this is, I get this idea really from uh, Newton. Um, I don't know how many of you have read Newton's queries at the end of his optics, but when Newton towards the end of his life was thinking about how gravity worked, um, he, he simply couldn't believe that gravity worked by brute inanimate matter attracting other matter at a distance. He thought it was beyond the power of matter to do that. Um, and how he thought it worked, and he could think of no other explanation than proposing that space itself, absolute space uh, in his philosophy, uh, he equated with the sensorium of God. So absolute space was God's sense organ, uh, one of God's sense organs. And therefore God knew where everything was and how fast it was moving, and was able through the divine will to coordinate the whole universe uh, through sensing it through the gravitational field. And I think that that's a perfectly valid idea. And if, if any idea of divine omniscience that's based on physical knowledge, of, uh, it's still a good idea. But that just gives you the position of bodies. Um, you know, we all of us have gravitational fields. And, you know, we weigh whatever it is, 75, 80 kilograms or something. It's a, a pretty undifferentiated kind of measurement or, um, uh, you know, each of us is exciting a pressure on the floor now, but it leaves a lot out. And I think the electromagnetic uh, senses of the uh, natural world and, and of the world soul and the entire solar system were within the electromagnetic field of the sun. Every change in our brain is within that field, which includes the whole solar system. Um, 
These provide new ways, I think, of thinking about how to connect some of our more ancient philosophies and traditional worldviews with emerging possibilities within the sciences. And as I say, these things are very controversial in the sciences, um, but, you know, it's, <coughs> it's, it, the debate is really moving on. I mean, Philip stirring up this panpsychist debate much more widely is helping this process a lot. And um, so what couldn't have been discussed 20 years ago can be discussed now within science. And um, I don't think I could have had a paper published on is the sun conscious and the general consciousness studies until two years ago when this came out. I don't think it would have been possible 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So I think things are changing. And um, I think that the, uh, when, we, when these I philosophies link up with science and leading edge science, um, things will get really exciting. Thank you. So, um, questions? Yeah, I just wanted to, to thank you for the past. I mean, I, I could listen to it literally for hours. Uh, it's very interesting. And I just, um, but maybe you heard about this, but they, they asked Chat GPT some time ago to, to simulate uh, responses to the question, why, why does it rain on different levels of IQ? And I, I think it's very precious because the IQ 50, which is a severe intellectual disability, the answer is basically what we are trying to do here. Namely, <laughs> it rained because the sky cry, it gets sad and the tear fall down on the ground. That's how it make everything all wet. This is the, I mean, this shows how, not, not how dumb the, the platonists are, but how dumb our culture is, which, which produces or, or simulates something like, like that. So, so so according to this all the traditional cultures and religions and the philosophers were, were just completely brain damaged right and this is this is ridiculous but i i think that it's it's uh, interesting that you do it from the perspective of science and i i want to uh, ask whether you you i mean you you as a scientist of course you you try to use scientific language and, and from scientific hypotheses but but I think one, one possible path, uh, traditional path, is to, uh, to, to talk about angels uh, uh, within the Christian tradition, right? Because, because the, the pagan Greeks, they, they would talk about the gods and some, the sun would be the god and that's all. But the Christians uh, call gods angels. And, and in the Middle Ages, it was believed that every star has an angel, which sort of takes control of it and, and guides it. So maybe it wasn't, the angel wasn't a, a, a consciousness of the star, but, but clearly there was this, this, this close connection. And uh, I think, uh, of course, this sounds even more crazy than what, what you propose to scientists. So I don't, I don't think that angels will, will become the, the, new, uh, oh. the new fashion. But maybe they are. I just I just wanted to to, to read a quotation from the, the second theological oration of, of Saint Gregory Nazianzen, fourth century uh, theologian, because this is really a beautiful way of describing. Uh, and, and he says that the sun is the bringer of life. It's the life begetting star, which is the most beautiful thing in, in the world. So he tries to explain uh the, the, the cosmos and, and and speaks about angels ministers of the divine will they are quickly at hand to all in any place so eager are they to serve so agile is their being each angel has under him a different part of the earth or the universe which god alone knows they unify the whole making all things obey the back and call of him alone fashioned them so this this traditional christian view is that the universe is is full of angels uh, who who move all the things so the quarks and particles of electrons so i i wonder whether you you think of of this also as a as a, as a possible part of your of your view oh yeah i do actually um i was i a friend of mine who's a theologian matthew fox is an american theologian um when I was talking to him about the consciousness of, well, I explored these ideas with him in the 1990s, and I 
got really excited because he's one of the people I can talk to very freely. And he said, well, look, why don't we relate this to angels? We produced a book together, which is called <clears throat> The Physics of Angels. And what we do in that book is we, we take the main texts on angels of Dionysus, the Areopagite, Hildegard of Bingen, and St. Thomas Aquinas. And we have short, we selected passages we thought were the most interesting, and then we had a dialogue on, on them. And, um, you know, one of the things that became very clear was exactly, exactly what you said, that this was a way of thinking about how people used to think about just these issues. Um, and the reason it's called the physics of angels is there's a passage in Aquinas where he's talking about how angels move. We never found anything, by the way. But, you know, the standard caricature of, of theology is that people discuss how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. We never ever found a single source that related to that. But Aquinas' discussion of how angels move was absolutely fascinating. He said that since they're, um, from the point of view of an external observer, they would move at an actual speed. But from the point of view of an angel itself, no time would elapse. And when the angel's in a place, the whole angel was back there at one time. You can't have part of an angel. And, and, and you just substitute the word photon or quantum <laughs> particle, and the whole thing read exactly like Einstein. It was astonishing. No doubt for the same logical reasons. But, uh, but that's our publisher, when he saw that discussion, he said, look, you've got to call this book Physics of Angels. I wasn't that keen on the title. But anyway, that's what it's called. Um, so now I completely agree with you. But when I'm discussing this, I mean, for example, in my paper, The General Consciousness Studies, I left angels out, although I mentioned Plato and the visible gods. Um, but I agree. I think if we're going to recover a panpsychist view, then a new angelology or a reformatted angelology getting from the idea of intelligences in nature, guiding intelligences in nature, is really interesting. And Alfred Russell Wallace, who co-discovered the principle of evolution by natural selection with Charles Darwin, um, in his last book, The World of Life, 1921, suggested that blind chance alone couldn't possibly give the creativity in the evolutionary process, and it must be guided by guiding intelligences, which he said, for which the traditional name is angels. So we hear a lot about Darwin's gloomy, pessimistic, uh, sort of borderline materialism, but we don't know very much about Alfred Russell Wallace's angelology. Um, so I think it's no, I think it's a really important approach. Okay. Yeah, that was very, all really, very interesting. But uh, I'm really, I'm really interested in morphic resonance hypothesis, and I don't want to dismiss things because they're you know, sound wacky or whatever. But when I think about it, it, I always feel this desire for a more precise articulation of it. it. It sounds a bit sort of too gentle, like, you know, similar things behave similarly. I want to know, like, well, how similar do they have to be? How long does it last? Is there any way we can get an equation or something to say, you know, from this measure of similarity, it lasts this long? Or, do you know what I mean? I just feel like, I was sort of want like a more like uh, really precise articulation of of those kind of things. Do you think that's ever is that something we could think of as is possible? Oh, no, it's point, perfectly, or... perfectly possible. Mm. I mean, I think the present state of this is a bit like <clears throat> Faraday in 1850. You know, he had no idea how you could explain the relation of electromagnetic electrical magnetic fields, and um, he knew they were related empirically. He was an empiricist. Um, and Maxwell came along 20 years later with equations of electromagnetism that revealed that light is electromagnetic, which was a massive discovery. But um, it took, and then Einstein comes along and gets rid of the ether that Maxwell's theory is based on. So, and now we have quantum electric dynamics as a way of understanding the relations of light and matter. Um, and the theories have changed, but the empirical phenomena have remained much the same. So, so that's I think of this as, a, as an early stage. The point is, right now, it's really hard for anyone to do research on morphic resonance because when it was proclaimed a heresy by the editor of Nature in 1981, it was actually he tried to excommunicate me and morphic resonance. And literally, I mean, he identified himself with the Pope he explicitly. Um, and so the result has been that it's seen as a terrible heresy. And so, although lots of scientists are interested in it, you couldn't get a grant for this. And 
There's currently some experiments going on at a well-known East Coast University in the US showing amazing results from orbit resonance with nematode worms. Um, but the person doing it was a postdoc. And he told, I mean, I was devastated when he told me he just can't publish it because he, he's done it unauthorized. He does it at night. And um, he, he knows his lab chief would disapprove and he'd probably get fired. And he's just to the point where postdocs have to apply for permanent positions. And the last thing he wants is to be engulfed in controversy in his whole career to be shot down in flames. And so I can't mention his name nor the results, but I'm going to commission studies in it somewhere else where we can publish them. But um, as soon as you've got an experimental system working like that one, then you can empirically decide what's similar. You could have <coughs> worms with a slightly different strain and a very different strain of a different species. You see if these effects carry over. Um, for me, it's empirical, not theoretical, because even within biology, if you're, if you're classifying plants or animals, say you work in the Q herbarium, there isn't an equation that says, you know, this species of foxglove is different from that species of foxglove. It's done by eye, by experienced botanists with herbarium sheets. Um, so even now, I mean, maths is of almost no help in plant or animal. You can do DNA analysis, and, but the, in terms of the similarity, uh, and some taxonomists are called splitters, and they say, no, these are different species. And then other ones are called lumpers, and they put them all together and say, no, all these species are one species. It's been going on ever since Linnaeus, um, with no general agreement on exactly where one species or similarity ends or begins. I don't think there's much hope of arriving at it through some abstract maths. Um, I think arriving at it empirically, though, is definitely feasible. And, you know, with the Wordle puzzles, you know, if you had a similar Wordle puzzle to one that was, you know, last week, very similar, just one word different, would it be easier to do than one that's totally different? I mean, all these are addressable empirically, these questions. Thank you. Perhaps this is a, oh, this is a question. This is a Zoom question. Okay. Um, this has to be our last question because we have hello. some wine hello. to the Zoom. <laughs> I'm sure everyone's uh, just uh, excited to go for drinks afterwards. I wish I could join. But um, yeah, I just want to say as well, um, thank you also, Rupert, for speaking. And um, I, this might be quite pertinent now, because I have to say um, some of my some of the best friendships from my time as an undergraduate uh, sort of got going by discovering that the other was also privately reading uh, Rupert Sheldrake. You know, this is about... <laughs> 2013 2014 something like that so um yeah it's definitely very exciting to be part of a panpsychism conference like this now um but um i thought um mentioning whitehead was extremely interesting and i think um that my intuition about this is certainly that white that whitehead may be in a position to show that um, the hard problem is a contextual problem. So as seeing as he moves away from his from a substance based ontology towards an event based ontology, it may it's it's not clear to me that the hard problem arises as such. And um, which I think is just quite interesting as it seems to be as it seems to work quite well with um, obviously what, what you were saying as well about, um, you know, um, it works well with physics and so on. Um, so my question is, um, Rupert, um, morphic resonance, of course, super interesting idea. And um, I'd like to know, have you, or I'm sure, well, I'm sure you know about it, but um, what are your thoughts on Whitehead's views on value creation and morphic resonance? Do you see a possible converge? Um, kind of, the, do you think that kind of dovetails possibly? Because in, I think in Whitehead, um, value creation also works as a kind of, uh, it's like being's memory in a sense is that when, when something of value is created in the totality of being, of course, which is event-based and temporal, um, and of course, Whitehead also uh, includes a kind of experiential, um, let's say, substrate to being, and that when value is created, um, he understands this as something that becomes objective then. Um, have you ever looked at that or thought about that a little bit more? Is, do you think there's a, a point of convergence there? I'd love to know. Oh. I, I'm not sure about value creation, but certainly I've looked at points of convergence with Whitehead. When I first thought of these ideas, I was uh, working here in Cambridge, exactly 50 years ago, I first thought of morphic resonance. I was a fellow at uh, college, 
And I belong to a small group called the Epiphany Philosophers. And one of the, uh, we had a, published a journal called Theoria to Theory, T-O. Um, so the idea was to take the idea of mystical intuitive experience and form bridge, bridge with science. And this was a group that included monks and several priests and it was mainly Anglican group. Um, and one of the key figures was Dorothy Emmett, who was a student of Whitehead's and who was a professor of philosophy at Manchester, where she taught Whitehead's philosophy. So right from the beginning, I had these discussions about connections with Whitehead, who had the idea of a kind of memory through prehension uh, in, in uh, so not a totally unlike morphic resonance. The trouble is that in working out just how it connects, it, 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 it's the obscurity of Whitehead is the problem, because mm -hmm. I was invited to Claremont College to the Center of Process Studies in California, which is the main Whiteheadian center that I know of. Um, and we had a two-day seminar on Whitehead and morphic resonance. And every time I asked one of their experts, you know, what does Whitehead say about memory in this? One of them say, well, Whitehead says this, and the other one say, no, he doesn't in process of reality chapter so and then he says that. And so it, it, the whole thing ended up, we got bogged down into a kind of quagmire of Whitehead interpretation. Um, and so I was never able to form a really clear idea. Um, although I've always found Whitehead helpful, suggestive, um, and, and setting forth such important ideas. But um, so I couldn't give you a clear answer to that because my attempts to get clear answers from top Whitehead experts failed. <laughs> and um, I can't do better than them because, you know, they spent years studying process and reality and other books. Um, but I do think he's enormously important and suggestive. And I think that the process view, uh, uh, kind of process panpsychism, is where all these discussions are headed, really. On that note, um, thank you very much. I think we, we want to sort of say thank you to group of um, absolutely wonderful lecture, uh, fitting end to this exciting day. And thank you for stimulating such a vigorous conversation. Um, I was very moved actually by your reference to Dorothy Emmett, mm. um, whom I remember mm. um, uh, here at the end of her life. Um, and that's very interesting hearing your own autobiography there mm. and the philosophy of the epiphany philosophers. So thank you very much indeed.